Yeah, I'm trying. Good afternoon. Welcome, everybody. Thanks for being with us today. We're broadcasting live from Park City, Utah, where I am. Kira, I think, is in New Jersey. Dr. Nazi is in California, I think. And uh, Afshan, where are you? I'm in Denver, Colorado. Denver, Colorado. So thank you all for spending some time this Friday afternoon with us. We're super happy to have uh, novel, novel 351K, which I actually know what that means uh, now, uh, back with us for a second time. A uh, big thank you to Kira for bringing this to the Family Office Insights attention. Uh, full disclosure, we've known each other for a very long time and uh, really glad to see her from afar. So thank you for being here, Kara. Um, we can uh, not hear or see you in terms of you being able to uh, come on the webinar to speak, but we encourage you to ask questions as we go along and please post them as they come to mind in the chat box or the Q&A. We have a lot of people coming on today, so we'll uh, get to as many as possible. Uh, super excited to, uh, uh, I've learned a lot about biosimilars, which I had no idea what they were prior to this. And uh, I think many of you on the call already know what they are, but um, we're, we're going to learn a lot today and see what the opportunity is and run through a presentation. And then we'll be recording it and uh, providing a link, if it's okay with you guys, Kara. Uh, and also we'll make sure that everybody gets in direct contact with Kara and her team post-webinar. And as you uh, participate today uh, in the presentation, if there's anybody that comes to mind in your world that would benefit from knowing more, you're certainly welcome to cause that to happen and uh, connect directly with Kira and, and the team. So with that, thank you again for being here. Uh, we'll get started now. Kira, are you going to take it away? I am. Thank you so much. Great to connect. Thank you for the opportunity. And I want to thank everyone for joining us on this Friday afternoon. Um, so I have myself, my founder, Dr. Niazi in one quadrant, and then you see Afshin, the other co-founder, joining us as well. Um, and really quick, Arthur, you had mentioned, you know what the name means, Novel 351K. We are a biotech company that develops and commercializes biotech products. And 351K is actually the FDA regulatory pathway. I will get into that later, but a lot of people ask us what the name means. Great. Okay. So as I had just mentioned, you know, what? I'm just going to turn off the camera here to toggle. Okay. We are an innovative biotech company. We are developing biosimilar drugs that increase access to life-changing therapies that reduce the cost across the whole healthcare spectrum. We know that there is a problem, that these drugs can be extremely expensive to treat extremely difficult diseases such as cancer. And we know that we could do better. So we've applied an asset light strategy that accelerates the development and commercialization of our products to get these into the hands of patients quicker and cheaper. We all have a sentiment and conviction to do this and get these to market. Dr. Niazi has done this before. Okay, so somebody might say, what is a biologic? So you could see on the left, a small molecule drug such as aspirin. Making one of those is similar to making a bike. It's not super complex, not super expensive. You could do it pretty quickly. Then you look at a large molecule drug, such as a growth hormone. It's like building a car, right? Um, they have some hefty price tags to them, but they're more complex. Now, what Novel 351K does is we build large biologic drugs, which is a biosimilar. These are extremely tedious, complex, and expensive. So here's where um, we dive into a little bit more about what a biosimilar drug is. It's a highly similar biological product to the reference product, which is the brand product. There's no meaningful clinical difference in safety, efficacy, purity, potency, et cetera. So many call it the generic of a biologic. These are identical copies of these drugs 
and they are produced by a different manufacturer. These drugs, biosimilar, offer more affordable treatment options without sacrificing quality, safety, efficacy. So what we're going to cover in this presentation and some key highlights is the growing market demand for these drugs. Our competitive advantage in the market, our very strategic pipeline strategy, the market differentiation, cost savings across the whole healthcare spectrum, regulatory experience, which is Dr. Niazi, our strategic partnerships, which allow us to have this asset light model, our experience management team that's all yielded different exits, a return on investment, and then very exciting exit strategies. So here you can see the trajectory of biosimilars. It's exploding. And the reason why is these branded products are losing patent exclusivity. So these drugs are coming of age. They are the fastest growing therapeutic category in the US. So now here is Dr. Niazi. I'm gonna do some bragging about you. Um, not only has he worked with the FDA on where these biological drugs need to be for approval, he has worked with EMA and various other agencies, over seven actually globally. He has worked on the regulatory plans to get these biologic drugs into market. Um, I don't even know how many books I've lost count. It's, it's endless numbers of books published. He's one of the largest biotech patent holders in the world. And actually the term biosimilar was coined by him. These used to be called biogenerics. The FDA didn't really like that. So the term biosimilar was birthed by the man himself right here. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Dr. Niazi. Um, so here you could see the novel 351K process compared to other companies, meaning, you know, the big boys, the Amgens of the world. A typical biologic product can take 10 to 12 years to get to market and cost upwards of a billion dollars. But these drugs have high yield returns. I'll give you an example. Humira, which I'm sure everybody has heard of and seen a commercial, that drug costs close to a billion to get, and it does over 20 billion a year in sales. So there is high ROI, but it is a hefty price tag up front. Now, if you look at where biosimilar companies are coming in, you can see that there's no discovery. You don't need the research. It's straight development. And the McKinsey statistic is that it's five to seven years to get these drugs and upwards of you know $300 million. And most of those costs are attributed to the phase three clinical trials. Now, what Novel has done, and Dr. Niazi has done an amazing job of paving the way, working with regulatory bodies, particularly the FDA, is to say, we don't need to do the preclinical testing. So right there, that knocks out some time and also some capital. And also phase two, if you look at the bottom, our clinical efficacy testing, and this goes to an attestment of Afshin's previous background of working with CROs and building one of the largest CROs, we are calling it a very specific lasered approach to get these drugs to market, which means we're able to do this quicker in under four years and for under $110 million per molecule versus the industry average, which is double. Double in time, double in cost. So here's just a little background on the power of the analytics and the cornerstone to justify these clinical studies. On the left, you'll see the typical old fashioned way, the legacy way that the big boys do it. A lot of spending goes into the clinical. Now, if you look at the right, you'll see where we're at. And that goes to show where the cost savings and time savings is. And what that means is using the streamlined process, we're able to develop our drugs faster at a lower cost and get these in the hands of patients. And if anybody wants um, a Dropbox link to all of Dr. Niazi's well-published papers, we're happy to provide that for follow-up. So here's a landscape of biosimilar companies and players. I'm sure if you look to the top right quadrant, you will recognize a lot of these names. These are fully integrated companies. These companies have hefty, hefty CapEx, right? They own the manufacturing, the production facilities, the whole gamut, huge sales teams. It's heavy lifting. If you look down to the bottom quadrant, you'll see development. 
novel 351k with three assets being developed. So again, no research, we are pushing through our development. With our asset light strategy, we're able to go ahead and part of the use of proceeds is to move up into a full development and commercialization biotech company. And you'll see some little um, footnotes at the bottom, Samsung, for example. When you look at development and manufacturing, these companies have specific regions for either just manufacturing or commercializing it. And for the sake of this presentation, we're going to concentrate on our goal in the U.S. for development and commercialization with an expansion plan to go global. So right now we have a pipeline with two oncology products and one anti-inflammatory product. And from here, you will be able to see that we will be launching our lead product, which is um, in the anti-inflammatory Q1 of 2027. Q2 would be our next product, and then Q3 of 2027. So that's a big year for us. We will show cash flow positive Q1 of 2028. And just to put these you know, numbers out there, the anticipated total global market, okay, and that's in 2025, for these three candidates is almost 20 billion. And we are really estimating a very conservative approach to get less than 5% of that market and then grow. So here's our timeline. We're right on schedule. We've kicked off with our partner, um, who is Similis Bio. The parent company is JSR. It's a publicly traded company from Japan. They are world-class, one of the best in the world. And you can see we are right on schedule with regards to our timeline. So, you know, we mentioned the asset light model. And the way that we're able to have this model is that we're optimizing our partner, which is the CDMO, JSR, to utilize their resources and leveraging their expertise and infrastructure. This is allowing Novel 351K, the strategy that combines agility, extensive experience, regulatory, and economic efficiency to shift from the old school fixed cost structures, excuse me, to a more nimble operational cost structure. Right now, you know, it's a very interesting biotech market and it's poised for disruption. And this asset light strategy is showing to be a growth driver for companies, not just in biotech, but various industries. So we will leverage their core capacity and capabilities to swiftly adapt to market dynamics, drive cost effective in our production and development of our biosimilars. So right here, this is a little background on our, our partner, Similis Bio, and you can see they've done this before. Dr. Niazi has also brought other biosimilar drugs to market, but JSR has worked on 18 biosimilar programs with six of them FDA approved. Now one might ask, where's the other 12? They're still being worked on. We are working on three of those, by the way. And just to put out some stats, there's only 40 approved biosimilars in America, in the USA, and there's only been 24 of these drugs launched. So we have a very successful roadmap to profitability through commercialization. For the sake of this presentation, we're focusing on the US distribution, but again, capitalizing on our asset light strategy and partnering with the right team. And this team is the team that has built Amgen, Sandoz. They have built these biosimilar commercialization strategies. We know that with our very specific pipeline strategy that we can have wins across the spectrum. So right now we are seeking $20 million in a convertible note. Over 85% of that ass is going to our development and manufacturing costs to develop our three biosimilars. Obviously there's some regulatory costs with regards to the FDA, very low corporate management. We are really, really nimble. On, um, on the spend. Obviously, we have project management. There's some legal expenses, business development, and then the de development of the commercialization strategy. And what I would say, typically, you build out a commercialization strategy two years before launch. So as I had mentioned before, Q1 2027 will, will launch. We are right on target right now to figure out where we get that ROI. So here you could see 
some of the financials. This is benchmarked against industry averages. So our actual expenses will not be higher. They will be lower. We have really worked this through and through. Um, this is on our lead product showing cash flow positive in year 2028. And for the sake of this, I put the net operating profit after tax, but you can see where that break even will come in and we'll have a very nice yield and also help patients globally that are suffering. So one might ask, what's a potential exit strategy? And, and you know, biotech has had its day since COVID. Um, so we've highlighted a few of them. Now, each of these exits represent a potential opportunity, right? Um, we have various different ways to be pulled, but the exit that we will pursue will depend on the company's unique circumstances and market dynamics. But we know right now that there is absolutely an opportunity for acquisition by a pharmaceutical company. One, And this is more as a stock purchase. Then we have licensing agreements. So we could enter into licensing agreements with other companies, pharma or potential biotech, which would allow them to commercialize and distribute the products. Milestone payments, royalties, et cetera, et cetera, would be an added plus to our balance sheet. We could partner with another biotech company um, that could have a very specialized development plan. It's important to note that we have capacity to serve a very large patient population. And so we could also divide and conquer there. The other obvious is an IPO. So we could look at that and raise additional funds from public investors and provide liquidity for existing shareholders. The last footprint here is the regional and global market expansion. There could be an opportunity in Europe or the Middle East, for example, where they want to expand their regional footprint and have biosimilars in that specific region. So let me just tell you a little bit about our team. So Dr. Niazi is the man of the hour that coined the term. Um, he is our founder and he has also built other biotech companies. He has worked on some of the molecules that are in our pipeline. This has been done. He has the know with how, also an advisor with the White House Congress. Um, he opens up all the beginning sessions for all the major biotech conferences globally. You have me, serial entrepreneur in life sciences, um, worked on various different biotech and pharmaceutical projects, actually started at GSK, it was Smith, Klein, Beecham, almost 20 years ago. Um, and then we have Afshin Safavi. Afshin is an entrepreneur. He has worked on multiple biologic products, but more recently built a company called Bioagilytics about seven years ago. That was the one of the most successful exit in the contract research organizations, um, exited upwards of $3 billion. And here's our team of executives and advisors. And it's important to note that this is a very seasoned team who has worked together um, in some capacity or another for over a decade. Uh, Sunitha, for example, has worked with Dr. Niazi for over 10 years. Uh, Monica and Afshin have worked together since the start of his last company. Um, Chuck has been involved in multiple startups with the team. Nick Morasco had built biosimilar divisions in big pharma companies and is an expert in commercialization. Dr. Jack Lewin, I worked with on two other projects. Actually, he's based here in Manhattan, Is was the president of American Cardiology Association, American Coalition for Healthcare. Rishi Moharte, um, an amazing storyteller, truly American dream with building companies and exiting. Tawanda Gumbo actually wrote the first PKPD in the FDA guidelines. And then we have Dr. Lutz Hellbridge, who has worked in large pharma and built out biosimilar divisions across Europe and Asia. So with that team, we are showing a lot of the parameters to make this company successful. And the goal is to have affordable and accessible medication, these drugs, biosimilars for patients while also yielding a high return for investors. So speed to market is absolutely imperative. And we know we can get it. We are right on target with our pipeline development plan. Again, asset light strategy, low CapEx. The team is experienced. We know what we're doing and we are all really focused on hitting goals. We have that experience working with the contract research organizations and CDMOs. And again, those partnerships make sure that our strategies drive these growth goals. 
We are extremely well connected within the biotech and biosimilar industry and community. Execution, execution, execution. You know, we live by these goals on a weekly, monthly, quarterly basis. Dr. Niazi is so experienced with regulatory requirements so that we actually named our company with the 351K in it. Um, and then our commercialization plan. Look, it's very different than what the big guys of the world are doing. And it's important to know that, you know, Amgen and AbbVie and the big companies, they have these biological drugs in the market, but the cost to get that revenue back is so hefty. We know that we can target different plans and execute and make sure that this gets in the hands of the patients. And then lastly, the proven track record of building and selling companies. So here's the team, here's some contact information. I would say if you guys wanna learn more, we are pretty active with posting Dr. Niazi, Post a ton of information on his LinkedIn, a lot of industry news and updates, as does Apshin and myself. Um, here's our emails, and we can be contacted either through email directly or through our LinkedIn. Um, and Arthur, I think that will conclude what I have to say if we want to open it up for Q&A. Yeah, um, that would be great. Um, before we do that, would you guys um, be open to uh, talking each a little bit of why this is so important to you. In other words, it's clear that you have a background in doing all this, but uh, you know why you're so excited and and maybe from your point of view, talk about that. Sure. I can go first guard. if you want. Well, and, and, yeah, so, and, so um, I actually suffered from an autoimmune disease and I was, and I you know come from big pharma in the industry, and I was astonished that I could not get access to the medication I needed, that a rheumatologist and a dermatologist, and I had to go through seven different doctors and then step therapy on my insurance plan. And then when I got the price tag of the medication, I was shocked and I could not believe it. And when I talked to Afshin and Dr. Niazi, I'm like, this is disgusting. We have to make a difference. And we're in a position where we truly can make a difference. So for me, it's extremely personal. I will also attest to the fact that Dr. Niazi, Afshin, and myself were overseas last year at a conference, and my poor partners had to um, grit and bear in a pharmacy in the Middle East while I was arguing with the pharmacist to get my medication, because in America, it's almost unattainable to actually access it. So every day I wake up, and I can't imagine that somebody doesn't have the same level of education that I have, right, to know what therapy would work and when, what wouldn't, and still have health insurance in America and not be able to get access. So that's the driving force behind, you know, my passion and enthusiasm to get this done. Great. Can you ask you, why don't you go next, please? You're muted, Dr. Niazi. Yes. So I think um, the most important part that we should all know, how expensive are these drugs? So I wrote a paper giving you the numbers. CMS reimburses these drugs and I calculated per gram cost. The WHO says the cost is $100 per gram. CMS reimburses them. The lowest price they reimburse is $400,000 per gram and the highest price is $25 million per gram. I think it is those numbers are so real okay. So what we're trying to do is to bring sanity, okay? I think that's what we're trying to do. And each one of us is so dedicated for this cause and we know how to do it. So it's not an issue whether we can do it or not, which this issue is and how fast we get there. So thank you for your support. Excellent. I'm gonna keep it short too as well. Uh, look, I wanna use this example. Uh, when I started my uh, one of my companies um, about 15 years ago, we started with $250,000 of home equity and credit cards. We ended up 15 years later, uh, selling it for over $3 billion. You know, we basically turned into every $5,000 investment into excess of $10 million of the investors. So the investors were very happy. I was happy. That was a change, life-changing event for me and many of the people who worked for me. But the better, bigger satisfaction was about three years ago, I was at a, about two years ago, I was at a, at a meeting. Uh, there was a father that was talking about that her daughter at the age of, I think, three or four was diagnosed with cancer. And 
basically she had few months to live, live. and um, she was actually going to college now she was going to go and go to college she got to live and she started talking he started talking about this life-saving drug that came out of Novartis uh, called cell therapy and all of a sudden I remembered that I had a call when I set up my company uh, that Novartis called me goes hey we're going to do this cell therapy and I need your support your company's support the company that we found with just some credit card debt, right? To go in and get it up and running. And it all came back. We did set up the company. We all made money. We did great. But the, but the beauty of it here, we actually saved tens of thousands of lives through this partnership that we had with Novartis. And it was even, even more satisfying when he actually took out a book that, that he wrote about the journey of how he actually managed to save his daughter. And the daughter has signed it. <laughs> and and uh, and gave it to me. And you know, it's a great satisfaction today. You know, uh, it's great. You know, I have a nice house because you know we made a lot of money for myself and for for again for a lot of investors. But the beauty of what we did of saving tens of thousands of lives that would have not lived. That you can't put a price on this. So when Dr. Niazi reached out to me about two years ago, it was Afshin. I want to make biosimilar accessible and affordable for worldwide use. I believe in this man and his vision. He's done it. He's already made two out of these three drugs they were making. He already made it previously. So, you know, I called Kara and I said, Kara, let's form a partnership because this deal that, you know, it will, it will involve it. We can, we can do the science. We can do the development. There is no research. But we need somebody to really help us with the commercialization, distribution. Really, how you get into the market and compete with some of the bigger boys is critical. And that's where, you know, Kara came into play. So, I'm sorry that my answer was a little bit long, but I just want to make sure that you understand. Again, this is a repeat of what I've done before. Is a repeat of we're going to put some life-saving drugs into the market. And during the process, we're also going to go ahead and, and make sure our investors actually get a nice return as well. So back to you. This is super helpful. Um, there's challenges in execution in any business. Uh, we have a question that I'm just going to read so I get it right. Uh, anytime you start market distribution, there will be large competitive organizations that will attempt to be a counter force. It seems that distribution will be very important. How do you control the providers that will direct distribution and follow up when uh, when they are may, may be aligned elsewhere? Um, you want to take that one? Yeah, that's so we have a very specific commercialization roadmap and using the U.S. distribution channels, we're working with the best partner in class and we're really tying them up. So it's not internally. Look, I started 20 years ago as a sales rep. I know that game. That's not what we're doing. These are two of our products are oncology. They're given in a clinic in the hospital. The other product would be in the doctor's office. So you have that difference between Medicare B and Medicare D, first of all. So that's an insurance play and PBM, pharmacy benefit manager, okay? So making sure that we have, first of all, capacity, which we have, and we're able to distribute. So you have to make sure that they are um, really sure that you could do this. Otherwise, they're not gonna put you on formulary. And then we're utilizing data analytics, a proven record of success, establishing relationships through the entire drug supply chain. So that's pharmaceutical distribution. So that's your McKesson's, your Cardinal Health, specialty pharmacy, and then also the Cygnus of the world. Global distribution, um, we didn't focus on as much, but there is a, a play for that. Um, but interchangeability gets brought up a lot, right? And so for one of the drugs, you know, that that's here nor there. But as Dr. Niazi said, you know, the average cost of these drugs is tens of thousands of dollars, okay? And you have middlemen in there that take a cut. Now, whether we like it or not, and we're going to work with them, it is what it is. But once you can prove reliability, you're going to get those distribution channels. And with our portfolio strategy, we can bundle it with these FDA-approved drugs that working through our commercialization partner, leveraging product portfolio, will have negotiating power with the PBMs for favorable formulary position and pricing. So the distribution won't be an issue at that part, if that makes sense. Um, the next part is that supply consistency. And so educating, you know, the pharmacy benefit managers that the payers and our true partner with the CDMO is best in class on both product quality. And we're able to provide consistent and timely supply of the product. 
So once you're in those distribution channels, whether it's retail, mail, clinic, pharmacy, are going to be best suited for Novel's product portfolio, and then we can continue to grow our pipeline. So I hope that answers and, the question. And let me add one more thing to this. Um, thank you, Kira, for that. And Arthur, you know, so commercialization distribution is one part of it. And I want to tie this to the asset line. So if you think about what we're doing, again, no research. So it's manufacturing the development, then the clinical approval, and then it's distribution. Okay. And every one of these, we have no desire to make it make it make a Taj Mahal of a big department and bureaucracy through any one of these, right? And that's why, again, the whole idea of asset light is so important to get these drugs, develop, approve, distribute as soon as we can, and beat the competition as well as you know, get into the into the people that 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 needs it. So again, every one of these three functions is outsourced to the best of the best that is out there that we have we have known we have had a conversation with they either work for us they work with us for the past 20 30 years of our lives so again the, i want to make sure the commercialization and the distribution is one part of the three uh, uh i guess this assembly line that we have and it's important to know i mean look the asset light strategy has been done in different categories right i mean it's been done in automotive right and in, in different um verticals but with regards to our strategy, these are truly our partners. You know, I make the joke that they're married and alimony payments, if they break up, are not going to look good, right? So really that joint partnership, there's skin in the game, right? We win, they win. There's longevity here. So we are sharing the risk, but we are also sharing in the reward, if you will. So they are truly, you know, our partners. So I don't know what the competition looks like, but based on your team it sounds like you've got leverage right yeah because if you started from scratch and it wasn't this team you would have to develop all those relationships whether we like it or not many things are based on who you know where that can push things along right so yeah. are there are there there's lots of challenges in building a business but in that, the context of that, is there are there other competitors that are as well positioned as you to get this stuff done? Um, you know, there was that landscape slide where I yep. noted that we were at that bottom quadrant. And, you know, we have a competitive analysis and a SWOT analysis. The quarterly earnings for Teva, for example, were out. So, you know, I keep my finger on the pulse with regards to the market. It is such heavy CapEx, right? And so I can go through every single company if anybody wanted to and say, how are you different than Amniel, which is Dr. Nancy's old company? Or how are you different than Sandoz? We are disruptive. I mean, this is not for the faint of heart. This <laughs> asset light has been done in generics with pharma, but not in biotech. And so, you know, of course we have a little bit of a target on our back. We try to stay under the radar, but to attest to Dr. Nancy's statistics, you know, the cost of these drugs is just astronomical, but you have middle layers, right? Like the Amgens of the world, and I'm not beating up any of the big companies because of course, you know, we have an exit plan, but the fact is there's so many middle layers of management in between it's legacy ways of thinking. So they don't have that agility to do things quickly. Furthermore, there's huge operating expenses. Um, so we're kind of, you know, shooting through quickly. What do you but think? Arthur, uh, go ahead. One quick comment, Arthur. Look, um, Dr. Niazi always says something that that is very important. Uh, we have we know what not to do. Okay, that that's, that, that's half the battle. Okay, yeah, and I just sure. leave it as that. We know what not to do. Yeah. And what not to do is what a lot of the big pharmas and some of the medium-sized biotech are still doing. So I yeah. leave it as that. <laughs> yeah. Fair enough. So what is, what's the next round look like if you had to say uh, without backing yourself in a corner? Sure. So this first round is the convertible note. We'd like to close this in about 60 days. Um, it's, a, it's a very interesting time, right? Just to be raising capital. Um, after that concludes, we will then be raising on class B shares upwards of $114 million. And so, so that'll how... be the next round. And then obviously when we get through our pipeline, there'll be market activity, which our valuation shoots way up. Yeah. 
And so there's a reason why we're holding back, right? I mean, we want to make sure that we hit targets on the pipeline because then that's market activity. So, you know, there's a balancing act that we have to have here, not just to take more capital in than we need, but make sure that we keep the valuation because look, we want to be respectful for those that take um, the risk. risk. Yeah. 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 And this is straight development, right? There's no research. We are straight development. So the big risk, it's not a competitive analysis from the other companies. It's time. Time is our risk. Yeah. So if you had to say how long after the conclusion of this round would you go into the next round? We're going to roll it. It's going to, we're going to start. We're going to hit market activity. We have all the big investment bankers looking at us. Obviously, they're not going to work on a little 20 mil. You know, the convertible note is what it is. Um, And then it'll roll from there. So it'll be around Q4 of this year. Yeah. Arthur, we're going to be having, I mean, right now, two out of the three products are in development right now, as we're speaking. The third one is going to start hitting later this year. Then we're going to have three products that are in phase one. Think about how many companies out there that in a matter of such a short time, they will have three assets in phase one clinical trial that, you know, with a market value of $20 billion. And that $20 billion, by the way, is only for the U.S. market. We haven't even talked about during this the European or Africa or, or Middle East, which we are, by the way, we're in contact with all of them, but just to keep things very, very simple. And the other thing that we did, we actually did all of our, you know, when are we going to be cash positive? When are we going to go in and actually, you know, that all the value, everything we have done is based on capturing only 5% of the U.S. market for these three products, only 5%. So, yeah. so this is a, such a conservative model we have come up with. But we want it to be, you know, we want it to be conservative. And by the way, if we double and triple that number, great. More more return investment for us and for our investors. It's a yeah, straight cool. development play, right? I mean, look, anyone could tell me all day long that, oh, addressable market share, you could do this, you could do this, here's the value. That's not what we're worried about. We have a very specific plan to execute on to capture 5%. And I went so conservative, believe me, I've gotten more black eyes than I want to admit with people challenging this. But it's straight 5%. Here's the patient population. Here's the PBMs. Here's the insurance companies. Here's how we get into network and just satisfy that. Anything up is gravy. And then also we have a global plan for expansion. But again, it's extremely conservative. And the last thing we wanted to do was, you know, prices out of the market, go for the full capital and then have to do a down round, right? I mean, it would have been a mess. So. That makes it's sense. very transparent and fair. And yeah. Arthur, you've worked with me years. You know, I used yeah. to be a real hard, hard one with the other companies pitching me. So I've taken that same approach with my team on this model. Totally makes sense. Uh, all right, we're not going to do that. Um, okay. So if somebody wanted to dig a little deeper, uh, simply get in touch with you, Kara. Yeah, sure. Me, Dr. May has the option. Sure. Yeah. 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 So we'll make sure everybody it, it gets in touch with you post webinar. Um, and uh, I, if is there any reason why and you can answer this later, but if you know, we're recording this, is it OK if we send it out to everybody that was on the call today? Yeah, absolutely. I think that would be great. And Arthur, I would say, look, um, you know, uh, I want to add one more thing. Should we actually have more interest beyond that $20 million that we're raising right now? We're dying to actually get a fourth product into the pipeline, which we know is going to be extremely uh. needed. So I want to I want to put it out there. Should we all of a sudden get 50 million? Trust me, we have product number five, six, seven that we would love to put into the pipeline. But we <laughs> kept the model very simple. The 20 million, our model is very detailed for these three products. But we just know that this can be beyond this three model. The second thing is, let us know, you know, again, if somebody's serious that they would like to actually, you know, uh, really want to know, learn more about investing, we have no problem with getting the plane myself, Dr. Niazi, Kira, one or two or three of us. We'll meet you in person. We want to make sure that you feel extremely confident. The last thing I want to sort of mention to, to you, Arthur, you know, um, the last four exits that I've had in the biotech, there have been between 7x to 200x on the past four consecutive exits I've had. And the reason for that is, again, once you identify the market, once you put a good team together, when there is no research that you're actually going straight into development, you know, 
it is, it is, it is, that's when you actually minimize the risk. We have done it. And, and so this is one of those that, again, we're looking at a very nice multiple return investment. And this is not a 10 year play. This is, again, four year, five year play, just like everything, maybe six year play uh, compared to what we have done. Dr. Niazi, please go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to add a couple of things. Today, I announced in my LinkedIn the launch of my third biosimilar which was manufactured in Chicago and in a small facility that I put together from scratch. And the approval says it has to be manufactured in the same facility. Somebody said, we know what not to do. I tell you what, if there's one person who can tell you what not to do is me. <laughs> I raised $600 million. And now I can do the whole thing for a small fraction of the cost. Because the key is in the regulatory you know, the process manufacturing, you know, you give anybody uh, $500 million in 10 years, they will produce a product. So our strength is, and I, I'm willing to sit down with anyone who wants to invest to prove to them, okay, everything else can be bought and done, marketing and everything. But how do you get past FDA? And I have had enough meeting with FDA. I've been able to change the laws of in the U.S. working with the U.S. Senate. We remove animal testing altogether. It took a legislative action. It took my meeting with Senate three times to convince them, don't kill the animals. And now I'm working on reducing the testing requirements. This is not in the best interest of big companies, okay? They just cannot take this um, uh, view. They are very conservative. All of my products, and I'm going to make this open statement today, were approved without testing in patients for the first time in the history, wow. which is the majority of the cost, okay? Same products developed by others, they spend hundreds of millions of dollars in testing. So we have a great team. I'm very proud of the team I have. Uh, there is no failure. The biggest failure we can have is two months late, three months late. That's about all there is, okay? So I want to invite everyone to ask questions and get the confidence that we can do it I know we could be will. Thank you. Yeah, super. You know, I don't mean to oversimplify it, but you basically shortcut the process by not having to do the research and commercializing something that already has been proven effective and uh, not harmful. I mean, and then hiring the people and bringing them on our <clears> team <throat> that are world class that built these divisions in big big biotech big pharma i call them the generals so i don't need a team of 50 Afshin doesn't need that niazi right we need generals yeah right and so arthur if you look at it look at it dr niazi is a pioneer but nick morasco was a pioneer in the commercialization indeed and we have and we have lutz who was a pioneer of this similar again by device similars you know in europe i mean we got the best of the best uh that that and underneath all of this all these companies that we have worked with for several decades, the best of the best are also want to work with us. So this is this is truly a unique model that I think I think um, I think in a few years a lot of companies want to want to copy what we have done, but they will be a few years behind. Yeah, and but they will copy us at some point. Super excited for you guys! Thanks for doing this again with us, and thank you all for being with us today. And really, really appreciate your input. And it totally makes sense. Uh, we'll make sure everybody's in touch with each other. Do you want to say one last thing, Kara? I just appreciate everyone spending their afternoon. And hopefully you share in the same excitement and passion that we have for making these drugs and getting them into market. Yeah, we'll make sure everybody's in touch. And as I always say, thank you for sharing with us the only thing you can't make more of, and that's your time. Thanks, guys, very much. Thank you, thank everybody. You. Have a great weekend. Bye-bye. Right.